Welcome to Pick Up and Deliver, the podcast where I pick up my audio recorder as I step off the train and deliver an episode to you while I walk home. I'm Brendan Riley. Well, good afternoon, listeners. It's a lovely day here in suburban Chicago. I'm strolling home from work and happy to talk to you about board games. Ha! Tricked you. It's not actually going to be about board games today, it's going to be about movies. That's right, it's been eh, 12 episodes or so since I did an episode talking about movies, and it's been another month since then, so I'm going to talk about some movies I watched. Uh, That's right, it's the Film Roundup episode. Now, as I often do, I will try to think about what would make a good game pairing thematically if you want to do a game and movie night, but in reality, this is the movie review episode, so if uh, that's not your bag, sorry about that. Hopefully you'll enjoy it nonetheless. Otherwise, see you next time. So I thought I would today would talk about the six movies that I watched in February and reflect a little bit on what I thought of them and uh, give you my opinion. All right, so to start with, uh, this one is one a lot of people saw. This was Oppenheimer. From a technical perspective, Oppenheimer is, of course, an excellent movie. I enjoyed watching it, as is true for me of all Christopher Nolan films. I have yet to have one that I didn't actually just enjoy. Um, I'm not sure, like, I know a lot of people thought Tenet was kind of inscrutable. I did not find it to be that way. I, whatever sort of weird, strange loops that Christopher Nolan puts into his narratives, I generally find pretty comprehensible. And so maybe it's middle-aged white dude to middle-aged white dude. I can really sympathize with his view of weirdness in the world. So from a technical perspective, I really appreciated the way it's made. And he does a nice job of building up these three parallel stories from three different time points in Oppenheimer's life and sort of tracking them simultaneously. It makes for an interesting uh, narrative that is uh, not linear. Of course, uh, all the actors in the film do a really good job. I particularly liked Matt Damon's performance. I think he does a really good job of playing sort of uh, somebody who's a bit annoyed and just trying to do their best in the face of insanity. And that felt like what was happening with the Matt Damon character. I really liked that small part. Of course, Killian Murphy did an excellent job, as many people have recognized. I was irritated or not, but not surprised by how little room was given for female actors to do much work at all. It's not uncommon for Christopher Nolan stories to ha- give relatively little space for women and uh, this one is another of those. I thought Emily Blunt did a pretty amazing job in the short time she had as his wife, and the woman who played the girlfriend, oh, I can't remember her name. She was Black Widow's sister in the Black Widow movie. She is a pretty big star right now, and I'm kind of ashamed that I don't remember her name, but uh, I thought she did a good job as well for what what limited space they were given. You know, there's a lot of commentary about this movie being amazing, right? And it won all sorts of accolades. I mean, I thought it was good, but I don't really get why people thought it was so incredible. In part because I guess just for me, like, the subject matter feels really covered. I don't know how people are having new views or new ideas about what the atomic bomb was at this point. So I don't. maybe I've just read or encountered more of it than your average film goer or maybe people just hadn't thought about it in the same way i don't know i don't know but the broad remit of the film did not strike me as incredibly unusual and so like i said nice job all the pieces but the story itself was i guess sort of what i thought it would be and so it's hard to really see it as the amazing thing everybody seems to think it is when it was what i expected it would be So, uh, that's Oppenheimer, three and a half stars. Uh, The next film is a small indie film called The Vast of Night. The loose premise is we follow a couple teenagers in a small town in America in the 1950s when something weird is going on and there might be aliens. The central points of the film are a radio station where one of the teenagers has a job as a disc jockey disc jockey and the phone uh, switchboard where one of the other teenagers has an evening job as a switchboard operator. The premise is really, it works really well. It's sort of like the Orson Welles 
War of the Worlds in that it's a series of sort of sounds that they hear and incomplete reports and the chaos of not knowing what's going on sort of shapes the experience. The two young actors do a really good job sort of portraying this compelling state and there's a lot of running around and confusion. There's a really interesting drone shot that follows the characters into like a high school gym where there's a high school basketball game playing all these people cheering and the drone kind of zooms in and zooms around and zooms back out. It's a really neat shot that you couldn't you just couldn't do before drones and cameras got a lot smaller and cheaper. So this movie is clearly made on a reasonably small budget but really compelling and just an interesting film. So like actually give it four stars. Oppenheimer is this big this big thing that did what I thought it would do. The Vast of Night just felt, it came out the story a little different. I really liked it. The Vast of Night. That's a 2019 film. Uh, next up, this is a film I watched after I watched The Vast of Night. I found, I, I just had an evening to myself and I watched The Vast of Night on Amazon Prime and I had some more time and I was, you know how uh, after you watch a movie, there's like a list of movies you might like down below. So I started watching that or going through that. And I, you know, a lot of the movies were ones and two, two stars, maybe a three star occasionally. Then I came across this movie called Beyond the Infinite Two Minutes. It was like five stars. And I said to myself, well, or maybe four stars, four and a half, but way higher than the other movies around it in this list. And then upon examining it more closely, I see it's a Japanese movie. It's in Japanese. So you have to watch it with subtitles. And I'm like, oh, American unwillingness to watch subtitles. That's where, that's why it's down among these movies people don't want to watch even though it's very well rated. So I gave it a try and of all the movies I'm talking about this month, this is the one you should watch if you're only going to watch one. Beyond the Infinite Two Minutes is a really interesting uh, film about time travel kind of. The premise, and I'm not giving away anything that's not clear in the first two minutes or five minutes of the film, the premise is that there's a TV in this diner and this TV in this guy's apartment which is upstairs from the diner and those TVs are connected to one another but there's a two minute delay between the TV in the diner and a TV in the house. And the big thing is that it's not just like the signal takes two minutes to get from one to the other. I guess that is kind of what is going on. The signal takes two minutes to get from one another, but that you can see through them. You can see from one to the other. So the, if you are where the, if you are where the past TV is, you can see two minutes into the future uh, is the best way I can explain it. So it's not a two minute delay. It's actually two minutes in the future. Um, it's an instantaneous two minute gap. And the whole movie is sort of about what would happen if you had access to this and what, how would you, what would you do with it? And it's a nice little bottle episode of a movie. It seems to have been shot probably on a handheld camera. And if not in one take, it was, it's cheated into looking like one take. Uh, there's a lot of going up and down the stairs and the camera following them and stuff happening in really interesting ways. It's a very thoughtfully produced movie, really fun, and something you should definitely check out if you can. It's called Beyond the Infinite Two Minutes. That's my only five star of the month. That's from 20, 2020, and I watched it on Amazon Prime. Well, we're at our uh, commercial break, or we're at three minutes. There are three movies. That's halfway in, and I realize I have yet to uh, suggest any games to go with these movies, but I will suggest them now. So... Oppenheimer, it feels like the game to suggest to that would be Manhattan Project. I don't have that one. If you were coming to my house and said, Brendan, I want to play whatever you have that's closest, I'd say Manhattan Project Energy Empire, which is a related game, but not in the direct project. Manhattan Project would be the one to play. That game is probably very difficult to find now. It was originally published by Minion Games, and of course Minion Games folded when James Matthew sadly passed away. Uh, some of the games have been picked up for printing but for the most part that that concern went when he passed away so that's sad um so i haven't played manhattan project i can't say whether it's any good i know that manhattan project energy empire is very good and i enjoyed it a lot so that's for oppenheimer uh the vast of night i'm gonna say the visitor at blackwood grove this is a small social deduction game where one player plays an alien and the other player plays a child trying to communicate with the alien and there's humans trying to communicate or the government is trying to intercept it and there's a basically the goal of the child or the children is to communicate with the alien before the government intercepts those communications it's a sort of deduction game a competitive deduction game 
that's weird and interesting and I enjoyed it the one time I played it but there's not really room in my collection for it so it did go away but if you get a chance uh, visitor in back in Blackwood Grove would fit the vast of night for beyond the infinite two minutes I think uh, that time you killed me has to be the game that I would play in connection because that game is so specifically about anticipating what happens when you move on one place in another place and thinking two or three moves ahead but also two or three boards ahead uh, I've had a number of games of that where I won or lost based on somebody not seeing that if you jumped from one board to another you could take their piece out and if you're already missing from one of the boards then that's it really interesting game well worth playing if you get a chance that's uh, that time you killed me all right, three more movies. I'll talk about a game after each one because I don't know if I'll get to all three. Now, the first one is The Lost King. This falls in the category of the British know how to make heartwarming, pleasant stories with a low dramatic arc movies. Reminds me of The Bank of Dave a little bit. Uh, in The Lost King, we have the story of a amateur archaeologist and fan of King Richard III who led the campaign to try and find the place where King Richard was probably buried, and in fact did find the place where King Richard was buried. This is a true story. Of course, the academic bureaucracy got in the way, and it's sort of frustrating to watch her chafe against these systems of expertise that prevent outsiders from participating. As an academic, though, I also <laughs> reflected a little bit on the fact that uh, people without formal training or without enough training will sort of stick their oar in whether or not they really know what they're talking about and so there's an interesting back and forth uh, about that in this movie it's clearly on the side of the amateur though and, and frankly so am i uh, if nothing else because the movie makes the bureaucrats look like jerks uh, that's the lost king from 2022 i don't know what game would go with this i guess um tobago maybe i think is a game where you are uh trying to find a lost treasure that is buried and you're running around trying to find clues to find where to dig for it that, that probably works i think it's tobago it might be kahuna i can't remember uh if you know what i'm talking about let me know it's a game where each person draws a clue and those clues then reduce the number of places that the treasure could be until somebody manages to figure out where the treasure is and get their truck there first so uh it's definitely a game that's been around a while i can't remember what it's called it's something like kahuna it's not kahuna i feel like tobago maybe but that doesn't seem right either. I guess we were on a, a kick for missing things because then we rewatched the Sandra Bullock Channing Tatum romantic comedy, The Lost City. Uh, this movie was basically just romancing the stone again. I like that movie a lot and I like this one as well. Uh, in that one, the in Romancing the Stone, Michael Douglas plays a rather sexist adventurer type. And in <clears throat> The Lost City, Sandra Bullock is the judgmental type who looks at the sort of ditzy uh, bodybuilder character Channing Tatum with judgmental eyes. So this is a dual, it's a sort of reversal of that trope. You got Daniel Radcliffe chewing the scenery as a goofy um, villain. Not all that dissimilar from the character he played in Now You See Me Too. Uh, both of them sort of hilariously evil. Uh, and I like Daniel Radcliffe taking just kind of whatever part he feels like. Uh, he's got a lot of range and he shows it. The Lost City also has a fantastic cameo from Brad Pitt. Or not cameo, but small part from Brad Pitt. And really funny chase sequences. So if you haven't seen The Lost City, I recommend it. It's very funny. Uh, as a game to go with it, I would say The Explorers, perhaps the Temple of Shock, which is the one that has the rolling boulder in the uh, pits of lava. It fits this game really well. That would be a nice pairing. Uh, like Romancing the Stone, that game has a fair amount of misogyny or at least sexism built into the art design. I guess you could excuse the game a little bit because it's French, but mostly it's just like the female characters are all drawn pretty buxom. Nonetheless, The Temple of Chak is a pretty fun game if you can get a hold of it. It's long out of print, unfortunately, so uh, not a game you're going to find most places. But if you come to visit me, we can play it. Uh, so that, that would go with The Lost City. And then finally, just a quick word for Jay Baruchel, or Jay Baruchel in Blackberry, which is a relatively simple tech bros trying to solve a problem becoming famous rise rise and fall of a tech company story uh starring jay baruchel as the uh, tech genius behind the research in motion and the company the blackberry it was a pretty entertaining story um i enjoyed watching that uh it is kind of what you expected there's a great scene where the 
skeptical businessman says, you know, that's a problem you can't solve. And they say, well, we solved it, haha. -ha. And that's always fun. Lots of good information there. So not a whole lot to say about that movie. It is kind of what you'd expect it to be. Tech bros solving problems, getting rich, then the downfall of those same tech bros works really well. I guess if I was going to recommend the game, not having played it, obviously Smartphone Inc. seems like the game you would play to go along with watching the movie Blackberry because they're both about, you know, Blackberries and related, uh, related products. Well, I'd be keen to hear what movies you've been watching in the last couple months. Those are the movies I watched in February 2024. To, in order to share that information with me, you can head over to Board Game Geek Guild 3269, and I'd love to learn what movies you've been watching. Until next time, thanks for joining me. I hope your next walk is as pleasant as mine was. Bye-bye. Brought to you by Rattlebox Games.